Sharla and this is Bookish Mama Blooms. I am going to do a little review video of quite a few books. Um, so bear with me because uh, some of them go way back. Um, I'm going to start, just going to head straight in with The Stranger Beside Me by Anne Rule. Uh, this was not the sort of thing I would normally read. This is about Ted Bundy, in case you didn't know. Um, the reason why I read it was because I read some Grady Hendrix and there were, I can't remember which one it was, but there was a list, oh, it was the the one where the housewives um, end up realising there's vampires. I can't remember what it's called then. I'll put a little sign there if I remember. Um, and this book was listed in the back as one of the books that the book club read. And I think I've just always known it existed, obviously. It's meant to be sort of a classic um, true crime book. And if you didn't know the premise, Anne Rule was already a writer and then when the whole Ted Bundy case um, began and took over uh, American imagination in the 70s, she, when, he, when it was realised who the killer was, realised that she'd actually sat beside him on a crisis hotline and that she'd been friends with him for years. So her writing is from the perspective of somebody who saw him as a friend then discovering that he was this killer that everyone feared and that she feared um, as a woman and she was a mother of daughters. The whole book is so compelling and it is huge. It is 400 and almost 500 pages. The print is pretty small. It is enormous, but I think the whole thing gripped me more because I felt like Anne Rule really hadn't got to grips with the situation. She does, she does kind of in her afterward... I think there's two afterwards because this been, book has been in print for so long. She gets into a little bit more detail about her own reactions um, and her own almost dismissal of the victims. Like that's how I felt reading it. I was like, oh, this is so centered on Bundy and why we might understand him. Um, it just creeped me out. Um, I felt like some of the things she said were misogynistic. She calls herself out a little bit in the afterwards, but not that much. So anyway, I just thought it was super interesting and it definitely gripped me. I was taken over for the whole couple of weeks that I was reading it. Let me know what you think, because I know it's it's not the sort of book I would normally read because I don't want to give my mind that much time dedicated to a serial killer. But it was really interesting about the sort of... Um, sociological background at the time in America and what people thought of women and what people still think of women. Um, this is the only book I'm really going to share about my maybe two months where I was addicted to climbing and I don't mean actually doing it, I mean just reading about it. So this is Regions of the Heart, um, The Triumph and Tragedy of Alison Hargreaves by David Rose and Ed Douglas. As you can see, it's an old book, I got it second hand, I don't think you can get it new anymore. Um, Alison Hargreaves was a British climber and she climbed, She was the first woman to climb Mount... Was she the first woman to climb Mount Everest? Yeah, without the support or bottled oxygen. Um, and then she very famously set off almost immediately after completing that, leaving her two small children with her husband to climb K2. Um, and then very famously did not... Um, well, there's a possibility that she made it. I think there's a possibility that she made it. I can't remember now. Yeah, there was a possibility that she made it, but she uh, she didn't survive, unfortunately. And I became gripped with the idea of mountain climbing um, because I watched a documentary about her and specifically her son, which you can see on the BBC, I think, still. I'll put, again, I'll put a link to that, maybe in the description box, because that's what started me on this whole journey. I just wanted to know why essentially people do that. Why do people climb um, very, very dangerous mountains? I can understand why people ultra run and stuff like that, because although that's obviously pushing your body to the limits, and obviously there are things that happen to ultra runners, climbing is, you know, enough, to me, it's close to being an astronaut, because you really don't know whether you're going to make it down. And the more you do it, the more you're exposing your risk. Um, and if you didn't know, um, and it, this isn't a spoiler, this is common knowledge, her son, Tom, um, would, would later die climbing a mountain in the Himalayas as well. Um, I can't remember the name of the mountain, um, but yeah, that's covered in the documentary. So she died very young. He died even younger than her, um, you know, sort of 
mountains away from his own mother's. Um, well, she, she's still on K2. When you die on a mountain, you pretty much stay on the mountain. So it's really, I was just compelled at the psychology behind that, especially as somebody who struggles to do quite normal things um, due to anxiety. What would make you do that? This book is, initially it's a bit dry. So if you do get this book, you've got to go through the first maybe 50 pages thinking, mm, this seems like a sort of, and then she did this, and then she did that, and then her diary says she did this. But it's worth it because they really do an excellent job of covering the psychology behind what was essentially a domestic abuse situation. She was in a very, very toxic marriage. She'd married very young, and she was trying to break into this male-dominated world. So again, I was caught up in her life, but I was also caught up in the social dynamics of the situation. Um, it is, yeah, it's, it's sad. And she should be more of a national hero than she is, because I don't think a lot of people here in the UK know her name. And I think it's because of this um, element of judging her for leaving her children. I think it left a sour taste in people's mouths. Um, when she came down from Everest and immediately decided to climb K2. But when you read the book, you realize there are financial reasons why she tries to do that. Um, and they're largely focused around her husband and his total mishandling of the business and the money that they did have. So yeah, I, I really enjoyed the book. Also, just the way they describe climbing is very, very good because I don't know anything about climbing and I had to learn a lot of things about climbing as I was going along and they make it easy to do that and really evocative um yeah it was my it i was captured in that and the whole of their family for ages i'm not sure where this featured but at some point i read um, alice roberts ancestors the prehistory of britain and seven burials i love alice roberts um that's not even a over exaggeration i really really do she's great uh, she's on twitter if you're on twitter and she's always really clever on there this was really interesting because I feel like her, I've not read her really stuff. This was her first, my first book of hers, but I've watched her programs. I found it really interesting how she incorporated gender into this because a lot of the assumptions, you know, a lot of archaeology is guesswork, which she does though. And a lot of the assumptions that you would use as an archaeologist is what you know of world, the world now. So she, you know, we're talking about gender a lot more at the moment. And she uses that to put a twist on things, you know. Um, does it really do any good to identify a prehistoric skeleton as male or female? Because we don't actually know what those concepts meant back then. And we don't know how that person um, identified within their culture. Because if you look at cultures across the world, um, it's actually a very Western idea, this idea of male and female and the attributes that go with that. So she starts off with the Red Lady of Pavilland, which is really interesting because um, early archaeologists used the fact that there were beads to identify the bones as female because they assumed they were jewellery. And actually, genetically, that skeleton is male. Um, I found very locally to me, which is why I found it such a great opener. Um, so yeah, really, really enjoyed. And she's just very funny and interesting as well, which is a great combo. Um, a little bit different. <laughs> Tackle by Rachel Harrison. Um, I love Rachel Harrison. This was, she wrote, what's the one that I really, really love? The Return, it's one of my favorite books of this year, I think I read it, or maybe last year, might have been last year. I love that book. This is sort of a lighter version. It doesn't, don't feel like it gets into the gritty topics of The Return. Um, there's a great spider in here that you will fall in love with even if you don't really like spiders I think you'll fall in love with him it didn't quite do for me what the other one did um, it was quite light but in that sense that was okay so if you want a light read about something witchy um, not really horror just something plotty and easy to read with all the kind of tropes that you would expect maybe with some twists this is the book um, I'm excited about her next one, which I think, is it called Hunger? I'm excited about her next one. She's definitely an author I'm going to keep reading. Um, then, this is Alex's fault. Um, so, um, if you watch her channel, you will understand. Because I'm pretty sure um, you started doing YouTube around Jaws time, did you not, Alex? I think. 
previously just Instagram, now YouTube, which is awesome. Um, I read Jaws by Peter Benchley. Never, ever thought I would read this book. I love the film. Who doesn't? But why would I read the book? Um, it was actually really good. If you can get over... The, right, so it's well written. It's not Da Vinci Code, okay? It's not Dan Brown or even a load of the crime writers where when you pick them up, you just think, no, I can't deal with this prose for the sake of the plot. It's actually quite well written. You know, it's not um, a masterpiece, but it's it's pretty good writing. But then what you find so... What I found so fascinating, fascinating is that there's so much misogyny in there, just casually just put in there. Um very early scene that we all know from the film of the girl being found on the beach. Uh, my favourite bit, and I think Alex mentioned this as well, was just the fact that the thing that made the um, police officer who found the body um, really sort of go green was the fact that her breast was flat. <laughs> Couldn't work out because, because like the fat had oozed out through a wound or whether she was just flat chested, but it was flat and that was gross. So yeah. If you can look overlook stuff like that. Also, obviously, as you'd expect, racism. Um, sort of progressive in some elements, but not really. But mostly I just found it interesting about the idea of a seaside town, of tourism. It's definitely a critique on capitalism or the modern idea of capitalism, at least. So that I found interesting. Uh, I live in a, a... It's obviously not the same as this, but I live in a holiday destination I suppose because I live on the Gower so there's the beaches and all the rest of it and there's a large proportion of local money that's made out of that so that was interesting to me I think if he were alive is he alive now I don't know if he were writing now um, the idea of Airbnbs and holiday cottages taking over towns would definitely be something he'd be interested in um, and then I went and watched the film straight after I read it and it is amazing like the film very different plot to this, by the way. Um, she's not the dutiful housewife in this. Um, she's an adulteress. And those bits are just grim, grim, grim. But in the film, yeah, I, it was a really good week of reading that and watching the film. So thank you for the suggestion. Um, then I kind of went into a horror mode. Um, and I read, I read Woman in Black by Susan Hill, which is something I've had on my shelves for about 20 years. I read this during the first heat wave that we had in the UK where temperatures shot up to over 30. And this was my way of cooling down, was to read about this um, misty coastal area and a dark and haunted house. It was great. It was everything it was meant to be and more. I did start to watch the film and I kind of lost interest in the film even though I love Daniel Radcliffe. So I don't know what happened there, but the book was awesome and should have saved it for Shorty September, really, because it's just the right size. Someone has parked up and is listening to music, if you can hear that. Um, then I read Stephen Graham Jones's The Heart is a Chainsaw. Now, this was a really interesting one for me because I um, read The Only Good Indians um, and it was my book of the year in 2019, I believe, or 2020, it might have been, 2020. Um, this was different and I know a lot of people struggled with this one it's about a girl who is immersed in the horror genre and she believes a horror event is about to occur in her hometown then you add that with the idea of um, a Native American town that has a plot of land that is sold off to white Americans, rich white Americans, who build like their version of a utopia across the water of this lake. So you've got um, their, their money is essentially needed by the town, but they're also erasing the town. It's just a really, you know, as with the other book, um, The Only Good Indians, there's a horror element and then there's the um, talking about uh, Native American rights and what it is to make Native American. I The first part, you have to know a lot about horror. We don't have to know a lot, but I know, I mean, I'm not immersed in horror genre, but I do know a reasonable amount. I've watched Halloween and Scream and um, bits of Nightmare on Elm Street, T Texas Chainsaw Massacre, that sort of thing. Um, wouldn't necessarily say I'm well versed in it in an obsessive way, the way Stephen Graham Jones is. If you are, this is the book for you. You will just fly through it. If you're not, those first, I would say even 100 pages, because it is quite a long book, are a bit slow going. 
but it is doing something. It's a bit like The Only Good Indians. It's doing something I've never seen before. And I was completely hooked in it by about page, probably about 250. I did almost see an effort and then I didn't and I carried on and I'm so glad I didn't. And I got to the end and this was the weirdness of it. Even though I had really struggled with the beginning and found it a bit like wading through treacle, I got to the end and kind of wanted to go back to the start and do it again. Make of that what you will. Also, sort of the final hundred pages are just, um, yeah. I mean, it's very difficult, I think, to transcribe a horror event that's happening very quickly on the page. I think that's why films, for me, always sort of do that a bit better. But, yeah, it was great. Okay. Um, then, I, d I read this really recently. So there's a huge gap, actually, between the one I've just talked about and this one. don't know what I read in between. Uh, Mexican Gothic by Sylvia... Moreno Garcia. Um, I really enjoyed this. It's definitely a different version of the gothic novel, which I think we need. Um, it's set in a sort of crumbly old mansion the way you would expect it to be, uh, but the mansion is in Mexico. Um, and the uh, main character, um, Noemi, she is from Mexico City and her cousin has married somebody from a family outside of the city, more in sort of the rural areas. And then she's not really heard of and she sends these disturbing letters reporting that she can feel people talking to her in the walls. So Noemi goes to see what's going on with her cousin. And it's that kind of classic, almost, um, I'm stuck in a haunted house and I can't get out type of uh, motif, which I, I really enjoy when I'm watching films. I don't necessarily read a lot of horror, although I am now. I really enjoyed it. I would say that it was a little bit less scary than I thought it was going to be. It was more peculiar. Um, and I kind of felt that Noemi was the only character that really had any depth. The other characters just felt a little bit cardboard cutouty to me. So I couldn't get into it psychologically the way maybe I wanted to. But that's just my taste. I think for the genre, it actually does a lot more than a lot of books do. So I, yeah, I would definitely recommend it. If you've got it on your shelf, you're not gonna, you're not gonna be disappointed picking it up. Um, and then the final one I'm gonna talk about, um, I read whilst I had COVID last month, uh, which is Why Did You Stay by Rebecca Humphreys, a memoir about, and then it's got toxic love crossed out and self-worth written over the top. Great cover. There are a million ways they could have designed this jacket and I'm really, really happy that they did it this way. It just looks so good. So if you don't know much about UK TV, you might not know who Rebecca Humphreys is. She was in a relationship with a UK comedian who was chosen to do Strictly Come Dancing. And I think you have something like Strictly Come Dancing in America where you have celebrities and professional dancers. And in the UK, at least, uh, it's quite a hotbed for affairs, marriages breaking up, usually after. It usually there's rumors and all this sort of stuff and then afterwards it's all amicable and blah 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 and they just happen to get together with the dancer that they were paired with <laughs> you know it's that kind of thing but this was one of those ones that actually kicked off during filming and the comedian was caught on camera by a tabloid newspaper and um, having some smooches with his dancer in the street um, on a night out whilst it was all being filmed. And Rebecca Humphreys was at home at the time because it was her birthday. <laughs> so she was pretty much hounded by the press and she refused to give any comments except an amazing Twitter statement where she basically said, he's a scumbag and I'm better off without and I've taken the cat and everybody loved it. Um, and then she went quiet again. She, she's actually an actress. She's been in The Crown. She was, I think she was Margaret Thatcher's daughter in The Crown. So this is her response where she goes through, she doesn't name uh, the comedian. Everybody knows who he is. She calls him him with a capital H. I found that very annoying. I don't know what it was about it. That particular, it just tripped me up every time I came across it. The him with an H. Oh, that was. Um... That's just a me thing, maybe. But it just got on my nerves because I knew exactly who he was and I kind of... I, I don't know. It was just a me thing. I didn't... That, that annoyed me. Also, at times, I found her sense of humour... Um, my legs gone completely dead. <laughs> 
I'm just going to try and move it so there's blood returns to it. Um, I just found a sense of humour a bit flippant sometimes about things that I didn't think were that funny. But that's just, again, that was, I actually feel like she's probably too much like me. You know when sometimes you don't actually like somebody and then it, someone else points out to you that you're exactly the same? I think that's, that's what it was, is that she was too much like myself and for some reason that annoyed me which says a lot analyze that as you will but overall I really enjoyed it and I think she did some important things and I think if you've been in toxic relationships or you've not felt that you're worth something because of certain relationships you've been in um, and you're working through that this would be a really good easy read there's nothing about this is a difficult she doesn't go into philosophy she goes into her own experiences um, with coming to the terms at the end of that relationship and also just like voicing herself saying what she wants from things so yeah that was um lauren and the books who um alerted me to that book so thank you lauren so that's it i don't know how long i've gone on for um i've also got some books that i've dnf'd um or that i've just sort of not finished and i don't know when i'm going to pick them up so i may do a little video on that but that's it um i hope you're all having a lovely day if you're in the uk i hope you're finding something to watch <laughs> because there's only one thing on TV right now. Um, yeah, and just take care.